Welcome everybody and thank you for joining today's Q&A session on the new communication on progress. My name is Bernard Frey and I am Senior Manager on SDG Impact and Reporting at the UN Global Compact. Please note that this session is being recorded and will be made accessible among others through the UN Global Compact Academy, our e-learning platform. The UN Global Compact is excited to launch this year its new communication on progress or COP. The COP is the UN Global Compact's main accountability and transparency mechanism. But it is much more than that. It is a tool that will help participants learn about relevant sustainability practices and how to operationalize the 10 principles and will enable them to benchmark the actions against peers. The new COP will also help stakeholders access relevant and comparable sustainability information through one of the largest global free corporate sustainability data repositories. We are very, we are very confident that the new COP will provide added value to our participants and our stakeholders. Let us now have a look at today's agenda. Today is the first open office and Q&A session. The overall aim of these open office and Q&A sessions is to provide you with the opportunity to ask questions on the new communication on progress and help you get prepared. Today's Q&A session is focused on the human rights section of the questionnaire. While you are welcome to ask any sort of questions, we particularly welcome questions focused on the human rights section. We will first provide you with a brief recap on the two requirements of the new communication on progress. Then we will hear a brief introduction by our representative of the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, who I will introduce in a minute. Before listing the human rights question of the questioner and open up the floor to answer your question. You will have the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. We will close by briefly outlining next steps to get you prepared for the new COP. Let's have a look at the next slide, please. This slide is to provide a brief recap about the two requirements of the new COP. Participants will be required to both sign the CO statement of continued support and complete an online questionnaire through the new digital platform, that, through the new digital platform. By signing the CO statement of continued support, the CEO reaffirms the company's ongoing support to the UN Global Compact and its 10 principles. The online questionnaire contains a set of questions, mostly multiple choice format, on topics connected to the 10 principles and covering the areas of governance, human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Participants will have to complete and submit both requirements during the universal submission period, which starts on 27th March and ends on 30 June. If they do not submit the COP by 30 June, they will be listed as non-communicating. Participants can still submit their COP by 31st December and regain active status. If they do not submit their COP by the end of the year, they will be delisted. You can find more information about the questionnaire and the, and the CO statement, as well as their requirements and our resources, which are listed in the next slide. The Young Global Compact has developed a set of resources that will help you prepare for the new COP. We strongly encourage you to get familiarized with them if not done so yet. The COP policy contains all information about due dates and requirements. The COP questionnaire lists the questions that you will be required to answer. The COP guidebook provides information on each of the questions, including definitions, um, re um, relevant related standards, um, or methodologies for those questions that are quantitative. The participant dashboard user guide provides you information on how to sign in and, uh, and, and join the digital platform. We also have like an online FAQ page, which we call Help Scout Tool, where questions that may not be explicitly be answered in the COP policy, the questionnaire, or the guidebook, can be found there. At the UN Global Compact Academy COP page, our e-learning platform, you will find all recorded sessions on demand for you to watch. These include sessions um, that um, have make a deep dive into the questionnaire, including the human rights questions of the, of the questionnaire, which we will only briefly see today, but not go into detail to provide more time to answer your question. Finally, you also have the local networks 
in your countries to, to direct uh, questions uh, that you may have. As I mentioned, today's Q&A session has a focus on the human rights section of the question. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dylan Van Trump, who is human rights officer at OHCHR, who will, have, who will help answer questions that you may have. OHCHR has been a great partner leading to the development of the new COP. We also have colleagues from the UN Global Compact with us that will help us answer your questions, including Cindy Mufu, Head of Human Rights and Gender, the UN Global Compact, Dina al kadumi with the Gender Team, Sylvie Jotzel and Julia Massaro with the COP team. With that, I pass it to, the, to Dylan. Thank you so much, Dylan, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Bernard. Just to check that everybody can hear me okay? Perfectly, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, greetings uh, to all participants and thank you very much to the United Nations Global Compact for the opportunity for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, OHCHR, to provide just a few very brief opening remarks uh, at this event now. And then we are on hand uh, later during the uh, event to respond to any questions uh, that participants uh, may have. Uh, my name is Dylan Van Tromp. I'm a human rights officer at the OHCHR Business and Human Rights Unit uh, based at UN headquarters in Geneva. Um, for those who might not be that familiar, um, OHCHR leads the business and human rights agenda across the UN system. Uh, in a nutshell, we do this amongst others by developing guidance and building capacity. Uh, including for business, to implement the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Uh, we call these the UNGPs. Uh, for those who are not familiar, I'd be happy to say more about what the UNGPs are and their importance for businesses, including UN Global Compact signatory companies uh, during the discussion time. We also support UN member states through their governments, as well as other key stakeholders, for example, in civil society, to help move the business and human rights agenda forward uh, globally, together with our UN partners, including the UN Global Compact itself. Amongst others, the OHCHR is the secretariat for something called the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights that some participants might have heard of. This is an expert group. We're also the secretariat for an intergovernmental, so interstate process, whereby different countries at the moment are negotiating a binding treaty on business and human rights. I'd be happy to take questions on the work of either of those two mechanisms. We also mainstream business and human rights through the UN system and, and human rights system. We have some special projects that might be of interest to um, UN Global Compact signatories. Uh, launching this year, we have something called HR for B, which is human rights for business. Uh, we are planning to conduct a series of uh, workshops around the world uh, targeting businesses um, on implementation of the UN guiding principles and the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. We hope to organize at least some of these together with the UN Global Compact local networks um, in your countries. So stay tuned for this in the second half of 2023 and beyond. Um, if there are any companies in the tech sector uh, in the room, you might be interested to look at our website. We have a project called BTech, which is all about business, human rights, and, and, and technologies. Uh, we have a community of practice with about a dozen of the world's largest uh, tech companies. And we just launched a chapter of the project called BTech Africa, which is a little bit more focused on like tech startups and tech entrepreneurship and getting the DNA of human rights in at the ground floor on the emerging new wave of, of exciting tech developments um, in the Africa region. Uh, we have another project which is all about focusing on what we call remedy. So in other words, like when things go wrong um, and people allege that businesses may have been involved in um, harming their human rights, uh, the UN guiding principles say that such victims or such persons with allegations should have the right to an effective remedy. This is like an issue of access to justice and also an issue of, of accountability. Uh, this project has been running for a while and uh, the most recent phase um, issued a set of guidance on how companies can implement uh, remedy mechanisms like grievance mechanisms, for example, complaints mechanisms within business operations. Uh, we call these company-based operational level grievance mechanisms. Um, and that phase of the project issued some helpful guidance there on um, a little bit more the how-to of uh, making sure that um, if people are affected by business operations, they have a recourse directly to the, the company involved. 
Then finally, down at the field level, especially if there are any participants here doing business in the Africa region or the Latin America or Caribbean regions, uh, we have a couple of projects on the ground where we're working with UN Global Compact local networks. And we have a whole series of capacity building workshops for businesses planned, as well as some key uh, multi-stakeholder events in which we would warmly encourage uh, Global Compact signatories to participate. So all of that is all on our website. Just wanted to kind of give a little bit of update there. Um, we have been working closely as OHCHR with the Global Compact for more than a decade. Uh, we, uh, I'll leave it to the Global Compact colleagues who lead on this work to, to say more if it comes up in the discussion or in their presentation, but um, there's a business and human rights accelerator program uh, where we are, we, we are a little bit involved in supporting rollout of this accelerator program with some signatory companies and local networks, especially in Africa and Latin America. Uh, there's the Human Rights Academy, of course. We have something called the Four Guardians where OHCHR uh, participates in a global compact event two times per year at a high level, looking at the human rights principles and the human rights dimensions um, of the, the compact. And of course, we, we did provide some technical inputs and contribute in our own way uh, to this um, new COP platform, particularly from a human rights perspective um, that the Global Compact has launched and that my colleague Bernard has um, helpfully introduced. So that's just a little bit of background. And then just in a couple of minutes, I wanted to say, first of all, as the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, we absolutely congratulate the UN Global Compact on launching its new uh, communication on progress, the COP platform. From a human rights point of view, um, we think that this will help uh, move the, 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 the dial forward uh, and raise the bar in the ability of UN Global Compact signatories to measure and demonstrate their progress on human rights, to build credibility and brand value by demonstrating that they're walking the talk and respecting human rights and how they're going about it in a very transparent and clear uh, principled and, and consistent way. Um, I think for signatory companies, um, I think uh, from what I can see, the COP platform in its new version will help companies to um, develop insights on how they're tracking on, on, on human rights and this can be very good for business learning and continuous improvement. So basically, I think uh, because of the new quite standardized and rigorous format of the COP, this should be really helpful for signatory companies. It can identify gaps and opportunities for, for improvement. And also because the new COP platform has evolved from a more qualitative interface to a more quantitative interface, I think this should help COP companies uh, if you want to compare your performance against other peers, as long as they're reporting in the compact, you should be able to see uh, where some of your comparator companies, comparator firms are going. And this can help, you know, build momentum for a race to the top um, on human rights performance. So for all these reasons, we really welcome uh, the new COP platform and congratulate the Global Compact for launching it this year. We're looking forward to seeing what the data have to tell us. Um, and there are like lots of other exciting um, nuances and dimensions I'm sure Bernard can speak more about to do with materiality um, of reporting aspects. For those of you who are more focused on the reporting side and, and prevention aspects and not only response as aspects. As well as we note, like there's a whole suite of tools already on the COP website. Uh, I noticed that there's an Excel that companies can use for data collection. Uh, there's a guidebook, for example. And so all of these things will help uh, you to implement the COP, I think, quite easily in, in your business. Um, finally, I just wanted to talk about one more thing. So as the UN and as the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, we ground everything we do uh, when it comes to business and human rights on the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. So the UNGPs were adopted by the UN about a decade ago. And they've been widely endorsed um, by multi-stakeholder institutions uh, worldwide. So bits of the UNGPs you can find in the, um, for example, the IFC or International uh, Finance Corporation performance standards for those of you who may have um, development finance funding, for example, for some of your business activities, you'll find bits of the GPs there. Um, the EU is looking famously at drafting a, a mandatory directive uh, that would cover corporate uh, sustainability. This broadly, we hope, will follow the language also of the UNGPs. Um, other UN agencies like UNICEF, for example, and ILO have incorporated the UNGPs uh, in their work globally. So companies with partnerships with UNICEF, for example, you'll be talking 
uh, language which is very aligned to the UNGPs when you come to talk about child rights due diligence and partnership due diligence. This is like globally now very aligned to the GPs. But just on reporting, the GPs, even though they're 10 years old, so just even thinking 10 years back when they were written, they already said that it was very important for companies not just to respect human rights everywhere they do business, but also to be able to know and show that they do it. And to be able to do this, uh, they basically say companies should, should report on their human rights performance. They say that this is really important for transparency and accountabilities and that the type of human rights information that companies should be reporting is of uh, material interest uh, to company stakeholders. So this can include investors, for example, and uh, you know, maybe also communities around your business operations and in your supply chains and your business partners and so on. So the, G the GPs noted that you know, reporting, like corporate reporting, sustainability reporting is always a moving target and noted some you know, um, emerging non-financial disclosure requirements and integrated reporting and quadruple bottom line reporting. And all of this stuff was already envisaged about a decade ago. So I think the conversation we're having now is sort of like moving towards the next chapter and at the, the UN, we're talking about UNGPs plus 10 now. So what does the next, uh, what does the next decade look like? I'll just finish with a couple of footnotes. Um, there's a couple of cases where the UNGPs say reporting is especially important. So one of these is obviously in higher risk settings. So if you're operating in, for example, a conflict affected setting or some setting which is very challenging for your business operations, the GPs say here, stakeholders and investors will be particularly interested and it's particularly important that companies report properly on their impacts on human rights in these kind of high risk environments and what companies are doing to address those and prevent those human rights risks and impacts. And then the second thing is the, G the UN guiding principles, even looking back a decade ago, were already thinking that um, if you're in a particular industry sector, whether it be oil and gas or mining or tech or manufacturing, garments, agribusiness, commodities trading or finance, you know, when it really comes down to the rubber hitting the road and what your core business actually is and how that might link to human rights, the guiding principles say that um, you know, sector specific indicators um, can be of particular importance so that you can understand and manage your impacts on human rights. And also so your stakeholders can, can know more about where the rubber is really hitting the road. So you know, we can also maybe discuss as an invitation in the discussion today about you know, how the, the COP platform, which is very um, inviting and, in, and user friendly, also articulates with maybe some sector specific indicators. So thank you so much. I'd just like to thank the Global Compact once again on behalf of um, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights for the opportunity to speak today. And I will stay on the call uh, till the end of the event just to be available for any questions um, or discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dylan, for, for your support and the support of the Office of the High Commissioner throughout the process and today. Um, to our participants, please feel free to get your questions coming through the Q&A chat. Uh, while doing that, we take the opportunity to list some of the questions in the COP questionnaire that are um, specifically most connected to, to human rights. In the next slide, we see that the governance section of the questionnaire contains questions that are relevant to manage human rights uh, too. So the whole section, which is cross-cutting, many of the questions explicitly refer to human rights. Here, I just outlined one question that is particularly important in order to address and manage human rights. We ask you, we ask companies if they have a due diligence process in place to manage the human rights impact. So that question you will find in the, in the governance section. Um, in the next slide, we uh, have listed um, all the questions that are part of the human rights questionnaire. Um, the questions in the human rights sections are aligned with the UN guiding principles. As Dylan mentioned, this uh, provides the, the key framework for our work and uh, do address relevant aspects to manage and account for human rights impacts. These type of questions that you find in the human rights sections are mirrored in the other sections of the questionnaire do, too. You will first be asked to select which human rights topics have been identified as material by your company. Based on this selection, you will be asked if you have a policy commitment with regard to your material human rights topics. And you will be asked if you're engaging with relevant stakeholders on the material human rights topics that you have identified. You will be asked about the type of action that your company has taken with the aim of preventing, mitigating the risks and impacts associated with your material human rights topics. You will also be asked if you provide training 
and to whom you provide training on human rights topics. Um, there is a question also on the assessment overall of progress in preventing and mitigating the risks and impacts associated with the human rights uh, topics that are material to you. Um, you will also be asked if the company has been involved in providing or enabling remedy in the case the company has caused or contributed to adverse impacts associated with the material human rights topic. And finally, we end the, the questionnaire as we do with the other question, a question uh, with the other sections with an open-ended question where you can provide additional information not covered in the questionnaire about your activities, the goal set, et cetera, connected to human rights. So with that, uh, we really want to take the opportunity now to, to answer the questions that you, that you have. Uh, you can continue posting them on the chat. Some of them we will answer in writing and others also um, um, throughout um, orally, um, uh, me and, and with, the, with the other panelists. Uh, we will be sharing uh, the, the slides and the recording of the of this session and you will be able to access it it in the academy um, also again important to remember that today's purpose was to provide an open space for you to to ask your questions but you can find on demand a recorded session where we deep dive into the environment into the human rights section of the questionnaire so where we go question by question providing uh, more details you will find that session on the academy also, as mentioned in the COP guidebook, you will find relevant information about each of the questions, including connected um, reporting standards, connected definitions and guidance, also on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Let's see what questions we have on the chat. Colleagues, please feel free also to, to raise any, any questions that we should address. We have a question about how important it is to have publicly available information to support the responses to the questionnaire. Does the question accept responses without publicly available evidence to back up the information provided? The short answer is yes, uh, the questionnaire would accept uh, those type of responses. Obviously, it is also good practice to have publicly available information in your report, on your websites, other communication channels. There are um, questions that relate to policy commitments, um, in this case, HR2. And we refer to the guidance of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which lists as a good practice that these policy commitments are made public, for instance. So it is good practice to have many of that information accessible to interested stakeholders. Um, in connected to this, there's the aspect of assuring um, your data by a third party. This is not a requirement of the COP, but it is also good practice in sustainability reporting. And we encourage you, if possible and feasible, that you also assure your, your data uh, by a third party. And there's a question about the materiality uh, topics. And um, is it okay to have any of those to uh, these topics as material based on our materiality matrix done with our internal and external stakeholders? Is it okay not to have any of these topics as material? So HR1 provides you with the opportunity indeed to not uh, select any of the topics listed. Um, if your company has done a, a materiality assessment, ideally also a due diligence uh, process uh, connected to human rights and has not identified any of the topics on the list as material, then it does not need to select any. However, we would expect that at least uh, one or several of the topics listed should be material uh, to your company. Um, so if, uh, but it could be the case that, that this is not the case indeed. for the. Labor-specific um, topics, 
um, that are part of the human rights, but that are then are covered in the labor section because they are explicitly mentioned as part of our 10 principles, for example, forced labor or child labor, you will be requested to answer questions on those topics, regardless if you select them as material uh, or not in HR1. Uh, colleagues, please feel free to, um, to raise questions to, to me and Dylan so that we can answer them. Thank you. Um, Dylan, there's a question for you. Um, I can read it. I represent MSC Mediterranean Shipping Company, the world's largest shipping conglomerate. We welcome the call of actions and the increasing attention from the international community, including the OCHR and the UN Global Compact um, um, related to human rights of seafarers. I'm quite surprised that this topic is never raised in discussions. Um, around human rights due diligence. Being a global company, we have customers from all sectors and we have been advocating for the past five years for the inclusion of human rights considerations related to seafarers in cargo owners due diligence. Very few companies supported this approach. As this topic is not mentioned in the questionnaire, how can we submit our data and areas of HR performance? Thanks. Um, Dylan, you wanna say a few words on that? I can also provide some information. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the, the MSC uh, company's question regarding the human rights of uh, seafarers. Um, indeed, this is an issue which has seized uh, the attention of the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, MSC may be interested to take a look on our website uh, and do a, a targeted search on, on, on the topic since it's a, a specialized topic and obviously of uh, key concern to you. Uh, together with the Global Compact, we, we did publish uh, a resource that you, you may have seen on, on COVID-19 and the human rights uh, in the maritime sector. Um, and uh, we've issued various uh, joint statements um, and so on um, that were consulted. Uh, we also have a, a working group um, in our what's called human rights special procedures um, that's also been seized of the issue. Uh, amongst others. So on the specific topic, I would just invite the speaker to, um, well, you can get in touch with us if you like, um, via the Global Compact after the, the call, I can direct you to these resources. You can also find them on our website through a search. More generally, however, I would just take the opportunity to say that the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights set forth that companies must always give due regard for vulnerability and marginalization. So I think I really welcome the MSC company's question because it's a good opportunity for us to reflect that, you know, business operations are not going to affect all people in equal ways. Effects will be disproportionate and differentiated uh, depending on, for example, how exposed people are to a certain uh, effect. For example, some people may be more proximate to an environmental spill or some pollution or com company operation. Uh, some people may be more vulnerable, for example, a child's body, according to, to um, well-documented research that UNICEF uses, is more susceptible to pollution than an adult's body, um, and so on. There are many gender-differentiated uh, gender impacts. I think UNGC has the gender expert here on the call, so I'd invite her also to reflect a little bit on, on gender and the COP and these types of issues. Um, indigenous persons, and so on and so forth. So this idea of vulnerability and marginalization is a really important cross-cutting issue and cross-cutting topic in business and human rights. And I think for those of you who are interested in risk-based reporting and impact-based reporting, um, and really looking at this meaningfully, thinking about, you know, where are our risks? Uh, you know, it could be the janitorial service in, uh, that's subcontracted, uh, that's in your headquarters building in a capital city, where there's a risk of human trafficking. It could be these types of human rights hotspots that are of a higher risk than maybe some of the, the more obvious things that, that may come first and foremost to the, the, the mind of management. So I, I really welcome that MSC question. Um, it's a bit specialized, so I'm happy to take it uh, also offline and direct some of our office resources. Uh, but I think the general point of marginalization and vulnerability of different groups and individuals, uh, different rights holders in other words, uh, when it comes to business related impacts is really important to keep in mind when we're measuring and tracking our impacts and risks 
And then also, of course, when we're reporting on them through platforms like the new COP. Thanks. And uh, just briefly to add, in general, also companies are welcome to use HR8 question, the open-ended, the narrative question, to add additional relevant information, for example, about topics where the company is acting on uh, that are not covered in the other questions. Sure. So you're welcome, among others, to use, to use that open-ended question for that purpose. Um, Bernard, there's a lot of questions on materiality, specifically if a company doesn't do materiality at the moment or if they haven't necessarily updated that process in a um, recent time frame, what we, we would recommend as uh, how to answer the HR questions and in terms of creating a materiality assessment going forward. Thank you. So it is good practice for a company to implement a materiality assessment and also in connection with a due diligence process. We, we understand that um, the, the scope of the materiality assessment uh, may depend on the companies and that not all companies may have um, the same resources to implement such a process. But uh, we, we strongly recommend you to do that in order to identify the relevant topics to, to disclose. Um, we link to guidance related to the GRI uh, materiality process, but you, um, which is a good practice, uh, but you're welcome to use others. So there's no um, formal requirement on our end. There's not a formal requirement neither that you have to implement a materiality assessment. Um, but it is good practice and GRI guidance, among others, will, will provide you um, helpful steps on how, on how to do so. If you do not identify per se, if you do not implement per se a materiality assessment, your company should nevertheless reflect on uh, which impacts um, it has on human rights, which are the human rights topics, the company's um, actions, um, products and services, and also business relationships can affect and which would be the most relevant for the company to act and disclose on, and then, and then select those. Uh, we have a question also connected to that in connected to due diligence. And uh, Dylan, we, we have a question that says, in regards to the due diligence procedure, uh, until which extent shall it cover? So what, what is your recommendation to companies when implementing due diligence process? Um, how deep should they go? What is the scope? Any recommendations there? As we know that it is something very important that we want companies, uh, that we're encouraging companies to do. Also, Cynthia, please feel free to chime in there. Mm, thanks very much for the, the question. So um, the question uses a technical term, which is due diligence. So because I work at the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights and because our focus today is on the human rights dimension um, of the new COP platform, uh, I will interpret the question to mean uh, human rights due diligence. And I'm just looking, I think, uh, Georges Delago, your question was in regards to the due diligence procedure and to which extent should it cover? Okay, so the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights introduced this concept of human rights due diligence. And there was a really good reason why the, the UNGPs did it. The UNGPs noticed that around the world, even 10 years ago, the baseline expectation on business was that business would uh, respect human rights. So basically, for those who are a little bit legally minded or ethically minded, it means to kind of do no harm. Right, So it's okay to do business wherever you operate as long as you do no harm. This doesn't stop companies, of course, from doing uh, like corporate philanthropy and investing in things that might contribute to human rights. For example, education programs, right to education, health programs, right to health, and so on. This is kind of like in a different sphere, but the GPs say at a minimum, companies need to respect uh, human rights. So this is like the standard. And uh, when the UN was drafting the guiding principles, it was looked around at all the different standards and the different available labeling standards and CSR standards. They all seem to basically establish this as the baseline. So human rights due diligence is a little bit more like the how-to, like a methodology by which you can uh, go about uh, ensuring that you do meet the international bar of respecting uh, human rights that's in the UNGPs and also in all of these other standards as well. Um, and I think from our office's point of view, uh, the COP questions are kind of like also mapped already onto this human rights due diligence thing. So I think 
one way of asking answering the speaker's question would be like when you have a look at the the, the new COP questionnaire, it's kind of like pretty much contoured, like matching with what we would call human rights due diligence, um, the, which it covers. So the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are aware that one size does not fit all. A multinational company, you know, with a multi-billion dollar turnover, with tens of thousands of employees and operations in more than 100 countries, will have much more capacity to do this kind of work, human rights due diligence work, than a small SME with 5, 10, 15, 50 employees, maybe that's just a national business only operating in, 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 in a single country, uh, they will be stretched uh, to do uh, maybe exhaustive human rights due diligence. So the GPs are flexible, scalable a little bit in this approach. But, and this is really important, even if your business might be a small business, an SME, medium-sized company, what really matters is the extent to which your business is affecting human rights. So human rights due diligence is scalable, but it's not just scalable on the basis of your company size, it's really scalable on the basis of your human rights risks and impacts. So you know, if you're a company which does commodity trading and there's a risk that you might be trading in you know, blood diamonds or conflict minerals or something like this, if you're operating in conflict affected countries or you're sourcing from these countries, um, you would wanna do pretty extensive human rights due diligence. Uh, but maybe if you're just an SME in a lower risk setting, lower risk operating environment, you know, maybe uh, a more standardized human rights due diligence is required. And the UN guiding principles mention phrases like heightened human rights due diligence, for example, if you're in a conflict affected area, for example. And, and if you go on the UN websites, you'll see different toolkits for this more extensive uh, human rights due diligence. So that's one thing I would just say about depth of, of due diligence. And then of course, you know, um, it's not just your business operations, which are in scope. And it's also written in the, the questions of the COP. If you look, it's not just operations, it's also value chain. And I did notice one other um, question in the, the thread, lots of questions coming in, which is great. Um, you know, when you do due diligence, it's not just about your core business operation. Uh, it's also about any entity you're linked to through a business relationship. So basically when, when your business uh, signs or issues a contract, you are linked for the purposes of human rights with that other commercial entity, with that other entity, and they are then falling within scope of where you should do your, your human rights due diligence. Um, for those kind of companies in the room, maybe you do a lot of mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, uh, that type of thing. Um, of course, you can integrate human rights due diligence also in your commercial due diligence before you, you go into a commercial partnership or you go into a merger or an acquisition. Human rights can also be part of your consideration. Are we taking on some additional human rights risk here if we're entering this market, if, if we're buying into this, uh, this business opportunity? So yeah, I think I'll leave it there, but uh, basically scalable, but scalable on the basis of human rights, not just scalable on the basis of company size. Thanks. Thank you, and, and any other colleague, if you wanna chime in, please always do so. Um, there's another question to, to Dylan and Cynthia. Um, if we obtain our raw materials only in Central Europe and also only do business here, how should here activities report HR4, which asks the question about um, action taken um, to, to address um, and mitigate uh, prevent risks? Um, how should activities uh, report if the UN human rights are legally established and also generally accepted and implemented? Is the risk and impact negligible for our business environment? So I believe the question addresses if of com we sometimes get the question of, of companies that say, um, well, certain aspects are legally established, for example, related to forced labor, child labor, my company is compliant with laws. Are these the topics nevertheless relevant uh, to my company? How would you how would you answer to that? Sorry, Bernard, can you just run it by me one more time? Yes, um, I think the question relates to a company based in Europe um, that sources um, products also in Europe and that uh, basically um, says that um, many human rights related topics are covered by laws and the company is compliant to those laws and if those human rights topics therefore are 
then relevant to report on? How, how would you, what would you say to, to a company? Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I think I get the gist now. I was just looking for the question in the in the chat, but I didn't quite see it. There's this uh, large number of questions there. Um, I think, I mean, this is a really interesting question and it's a great question. So if I understand the gist of the question properly, it's basically, you know, companies tend to try to abide by the law and um, companies are regulated by many laws, you know, the, the labor law, Maybe there's a specific law on um, equal opportunities or non-discrimination. There are land acquisition laws, uh, for example. Of course, there'll be a, a corporate law, a company law um, in all jurisdictions. Um, if companies are listed on stock exchanges, then there'll be regulatory requirements, uh, again, uh, including on reporting, by the way, for, for of course, listing on, on your stock exchanges. So companies are like heavily regulated by black letter law. So I think, I mean, one answer, like in scenario A, the answer to your question is pretty straightforward. Yeah, just because it's a matter of legal compliance, it's still reportable, I think. You know, maybe Bernard might want to offer a different view, but, you know, um, laws can be relatively progressive or not. Uh, but compliance with the law is, I think, uh, you know, shouldn't preclude you from also reporting in a, in a, in a corporate responsibility platform like the, the COP, in, in my view. Right, because I, I think that you know black letter law and some of these more voluntary initiatives like the UN Global Compact, you know, in many cases we're all sort of pointing in the same direction and we're trying to achieve the same thing by by different means, right? So I think generally speaking, um, sure, like report things um, even when you're doing it for the sake of of legal compliance, right? There could be many other drivers for respecting human rights, for example you know, to attract ethical investments or to appease certain shareholders or to minimize risks or because it's the CEO's vision and values or, you know, what have you. But respecting um, and staying within the boundaries of black letter law is a fine reason to respect human rights. And, you know, those actions that you take to, to follow the law and be legally compliant, in, in my view, absolutely reportable, for sure. Um, then there are scenarios, and I, I won't go into it here unless there's specific questions that come up in the chat, you know, but um, there may be areas where, you know, your company's own, uh, I guess, internal standards and the standards you're trying to meet, for example, the standards of the COP are not well covered by laws, maybe in, in um, some countries where you have business units or some countries where you have important suppliers, you know, there may be gaps in national legislation um, when it comes to, to human rights. Um, there may even be some jurisdictions where you're operating in or that you're sourcing from where the national laws are not really that compatible with human rights. Um, national laws are not always uh, progressive when it comes to human rights and, and may be detrimental to respecting human rights. So in these cases, you know, we often get inquiries and there is some guidance on our website. We have something called the uh, interpretive guide, interpretive guide you can Google for the UNGPs. We deal in that interpretive guide with what to do if national law seems to be working against human rights, but your company wants to operate in that jurisdiction or do business with an entity in that jurisdiction, source through a global supply chain to that jurisdiction. You want to show that you're respecting human rights, but at the same time, you want to do business there. And the national laws seem to be working against you and how to manage these, these sometimes quite tricky sort of so-called human rights dilemmas. So I think it's a great question. And I, I think the really interesting dilemmas that, that often come up are these kind of discrepancies a little bit or gaps in, in national law. Um, the guiding principles, just to finish, do say that, you know, if the national law sets a low bar that's lower than the human rights standard, uh, this is not an excuse for the company to not respect human rights in that jurisdiction. So if there's a big gap in national law or the national law is not very updated or progressive by international standards, you know, your legal team, uh, like your legal counsel inside your business, they'll be saying, we only have to do this because this is the, the legal standard in this country. Uh, but, you know, the, the global expectation, the expectation of the global compact participation and the COP and the expectation in the UN guiding principles and so on is that, you know, you respect human rights wherever you do business. So even if there's low protection and gaps in national law, low standards, outdated laws in certain countries, uh, as far as the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are concerned, 
this is like not a free pass or not an excuse uh, to only meet the national standards. There, you have to do business at a higher standard than national uh, law. And of course, sorry, I'll just finish. Companies can also, of course, do some advocacy, some policy advocacy to help create a level playing field where they do business, you know, maybe calling for certain laws to be updated and, and uh, reviewed and revised and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Dylan. Um, we have two questions that may be connected. One is how can we achieve the, the questions in, in section two? At, at least that's how I understand it. And then a, a question from a former UN colleague who is now working, in, as I understand, in a company in the cargo division and in charge of implementing due diligence there and would like to have additional support from the Global Compact and OECHR to advance the international business and human rights agenda. Uh, Cynthia and, and Dylan, and Dylan, you mentioned a few points in your introductory remarks, but maybe in a few sentences, um, what, are, what are key points of companies that uh, engaging through the UN Global Compact and, and with OECHR can do uh, to advance uh, the, our human rights agenda, what are key activities and what is the value of engaging with the UN Global Compact? If you want to provide a few sentences on that. Mm. First of all, uh, thank you and welcome. It's always great to talk to a, a UN colleague. Sounds like you have a, a challenging job. Yeah, I, I think I'll just try to generalize the question, right? Because there'll be a lot of participants in the room, I imagine, who, uh, you know, they have to think about this in terms of procurement. Like, okay, we've got this uh, contracting and procurement division. Um, we've got the supply chains department. We've got all these suppliers somewhere. Um, you know, we've, we have X number of contracts uh, at any one time with business partners. You know, for some companies, this can be like thousands of suppliers or tens of thousands of subcontractors and, and suppliers. So I think I'll just sort of like try to generalize the question. I mean, like in my view, having thought about this for a while, I, I would just advise anyone going about this to think about it like from a human centric approach and a risk based approach. So I think this is probably like one of the more efficient ways to go about this. So, you know, just to think about like based on where we are operating, do we have like a good uh, evidence based indicator based risk map um, of where those business partners are, where those suppliers are? Um, are we putting in good data? you know, good data in, good data out. So, you know, do we have a good geographic risk map? Are we thinking about certain industry sectors that could be hotspots for human rights? So, you know, somebody mentioned about shipping, so that brings in seafarers' rights. There are other sectors um, that may be higher risk than others for certain human rights. So if we really thought about this and built a kind of risk-based map and then, you know, run all our contracts and run all our, maybe in your case, cargo uh, logistics or work, uh, you know, through this, and, you know, have a look at that and see what it tells us. And, you know, and, and if we consulted uh, like internally with the different business units, you know, and the men and women out there on the ground who work in the company, you know, what are they seeing? Are we having a community of practice on business and human rights? Is the discourse open? Uh, Cross-functional working groups is a really good idea. So you could have your human resources division, your supply division together with your legal folk. So like everyone is kind of thinking about this uh, together you know I mean there's plenty of like really like interesting and good ways to go about it. It, it I think the right answer probably differs a bit from company to company um you know I, I would just I mean I guess my colleague seems to be from many years of experience in the UN would would be back to front across the UN guiding principles on business and human rights but you know we also have the interpretive guide that I mentioned which unpacks a bit more uh, on the business specific business responsibilities there and then I think you know for cargo and other things I think there are third parties that have probably issued some some sector specific tools and, and guides there may be UN global compact colleagues who can help to point you to, to some of those things so there's kind of like no silver bullet and no one size fits all but there are some really cool and really neat ways to go about this that will definitely improve the performance of any company on human rights give you great stories that you can tell give you good reportables on the COP you know, and reduce your legal risk, reduce, reduce your reputational risk, um, even reduce your operating costs. Um, there was a really cool study done by, by some colleagues at Harvard a while ago, and, you know, they estimated huge numbers um, in terms of the cost for the extractive sector of just basically not engaging properly with the communities around extractive operations. Um, this results in, you know, community protests, uh, stop works, uh, regulatory fines, sometimes strikes of workers, you know, maybe litigation costs. 
you add all of this up and you start to think about how much time it's consuming for all of your senior managers who are supposed to be running those facilities. And all of a sudden you, you get some astronomical figures for the downside cost of, of like not getting this right, basically. So I think um, there's plenty of good reasons to do it well. And there's plenty of like, uh, you know, really cool ways to go about it. And there's lots and lots of tools that I would encourage people to, to go and Google. Thanks. And uh, Sergey, if you want to say a few sentences about the value yeah. of matching with the Young Global um, Compact. I mean, I completely uh, agree with Dylan. Um, of course, I think from, from a Global Compact point of view, um, you know, we really do start at the sort of the entry point with, with our companies. Um, we can't assume where, you know, companies are in terms of, of their human rights uh, in, their, in their business. So, um, once again, we start with this due diligence, you know, that's always at the, the, the entry point, really understanding what human rights um, in terms of your business needs, what it looks like, what the landscape looks like for you and what you should be paying attention to. Um, and uh, in terms of helping, um, we really do invest a lot of time in, in our tools. Um, something like the, 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 the Business and Human Rights Accelerator, for example, is a direct result of feedback and data telling us that you know companies aren't really where we expect them to be. They, they may understand the fact that this is an area that is important, but they, in in, in terms of practical, um, in terms of practicalities, um, aren't clear about really how they go about making sure that they do no harm. What is impacted? You know, how do they understand? What the guiding principles are trying to 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 tell them. So really, our role is really really focused on helping you um, walk through that journey right at the beginning um, from the basics. And then, of course, as Dylan said, depending on on the sector you're in, depending on on the kind of operations um, you run, depending on your supply chain, you know, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and there are various ways that you know, as the global compact. We support our companies in in making sure that they are uh, they're very mindful of their, their their business practices. So what I would say is that certainly the the way the COP the questions in the COP are are put together really take into consideration that you are starting somewhere, you know, um, and you are constantly evolving, um, and that's why these questions you can answer over and over and over again year and year and, and then see your progression. Um, so it's always a case of, of starting and that's where, you know, we really do um, help is, is helping you sort of start on that journey um, and, and map out that landscape um, for, for, for you and for, for your, for sometimes for your, your, your supply chain as well. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. Um, as uh, we do not have more questions in the Q&A chat and we are approaching the end of the session, uh, we will take uh, the opportunity to highlight a few next steps that can help you prepare for the, for the COP. Over to Sylvie. Thank you, Renard, and thank you, everybody, uh, for joining and for, your, and for your questions. A couple of next steps. As you're preparing for the launch on the 27th of March of the universal submission period for the COP, we ask you to review your company information on the UN Global Compact participant profile page to make sure that your information is accurate, um, that your proper login credentials are set up, um, so that way when you go to log in to the digital platform, everything is as smooth as possible. We would also like you, um, if you are interested, if you have additional questions, we have upcoming Q&A sessions that will be uh, quite similar to this one's on the topics of labor, environment, and anti-corruption coming up in March and April. Um, and also, of course, um, to review our COP resources, which are available on the Academy page and also on the UNGC website. Um, and uh, to continue keeping an eye on all marketing communications and on the website in general to get familiar and prepared um, to begin reporting. And I think that's it from all of us. Thank you so much again for joining. Special thank you to our, our UN colleagues for your help today. Um, and we hope to see you on the 22nd of March. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dylan and Cynthia and colleagues for your support. And thank you to all participants. And we are excited to in this new phase of launching the new COP and look forward to engaging with all of you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>